Welcome to another weekend message. This is Father's Day weekend. So uh, God bless all you dads out there. And uh, it's just uh, a great time to, to focus on family and the things of God. So I'm glad you're with us this week. I'm always happy to be with you and to open God's word for you. And uh, I just, uh, again, grateful for our online church. And uh, you can certainly be a part of it. Please engage with us. Go to our website and uh, find out how you can participate, how you can give, how you can serve. All right. Be a part of us, no matter where you're located, uh, be a part of our family. Well, I, I want to talk uh, about uh, uh, really focus on fathers, but let's pray first before we do. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for our dads. Uh, we thank you for you being our Heavenly Father, a perfect father who loves us and provides for us, who guides us and cares us, even disciplines us when we go off track, but always out of a heart of love. And we thank you so much that you gave your only son for us, that we might be your children. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, let me share a screen with you as we talk about this uh, topic that I am calling faithful men, faithful men. Whether we choose to believe it or not, the statistics, well, they just don't lie. They're conclusive. Dr. James Cryle, a sociological researcher from the University of Minnesota, states that Americans are more likely to attend church regularly if their fathers did when they were growing up. Dr. Krill stated, if you are a kid who grew up in a family that went to church, you're more apt to go to church. And this is particularly true if your father went to church with you. Addressing students and faculty at the St. Paul Seminary, Dr. Kyle concluded, anything we can do to involve males in the church will have a significant impact on the future generations. Well, I thank God more and more as I grow and become involved with families and that my dad, my mom, made church a top priority in my youth growing up in my home. Now, I don't think Paul's letter to Timothy and his instructions for this young pastor were either culturally or sexually biased. He told Timothy that the success of the church of Jesus Christ would hinge upon faithful men. Read this passage with me. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Faithful men, men committed to Christ, men committed to their families, to their marriages, to their church. According to a report uh, released by our General Board of Discipleship, about 61% of active United Methodists are women compared to 39% of men. Dr. George Hunter, a former uh, professor at, seminary at the Asbury Theological Seminary, said the ratio is probably even more off balance. In the 50s, there were about 53 active women to 47 active men. Today, he said the ratio is more like 65 active women to 35 active men. How does that compare to the United States population ratio? Well, among Americans past age 15, women only outnumber men 52 Point four to forty seven point six. Timothy, my son, whatever you've heard me entrust to faithful men who will teach others. Again, is that culturally biased? Is it sexually biased? Our own United Methodist General Board of Discipleship recorded their studies. In declining churches, the ratio of women to men is 64 women to 36 men. In stable churches, neither dying or growing, the ratio is 62 women to 38 men. In growing churches, vital churches, the ratio is 58 women to 42 men. In other words, life and vitality and growth, the ability for a church to be in mission and growing and reaching people seems directly in proportion to the number of active faithful men committed to Christ and committed to their marriages, committed to their families, committed to their church. Well, where have all the men gone? I believe there's multiple and complex reasons for that, but there's three critical barriers that come readily to mind. 
The first is an attitudinal barrel that a barrier that faith and religion, prayer, by that's women's work. <laughs> and now, ladies, don't hear what I'm not saying. I thank God for the scores of faithful women in the church of Jesus Christ. From today to the very beginning at the empty tomb of Jesus, it was women who have and will continue to hold Christ's church together. The men who followed Jesus Christ ran and hid. They didn't believe Mary's report of the resurrection. The women were the first to see the resurrected Lord. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, the same letter we're reading now, he reminded Timothy at the very opening of the letter, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you. Timothy apparently grew up with no faithful men in his life other than the Apostle Paul, no believing dad or grandfather. The contributions of women throughout the Bible and church history are unfathomable. And yet, Paul instructs Timothy to work on the men, to bounce his church with men, make outreach and nurture to men a priority of the church ministry, equip men, to lead their families, to be faithful men who can teach others. You see, the principle is sound. Win the man, and you win his whole family. We see this uh, in the instance in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer. Uh, Paul and Silas are miraculously released from jail, and the Philippian jailer faints practically because he knows he'll be executed for Paul and Silas escaping. But Paul says, believe in the Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved and your entire household. Listen, that household wasn't automatically saved, but Paul was saying, your influence will save your family. Same thing happened to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He was a devout man who feared God with his whole household. Peter told him, your household will be saved because of this faithful man. And it was as true then as it is today. According to our statistics, if you don't win the men, the family unit gets splintered. Maybe just the kids are sent to church and, or mom or the wife alone. The statistics are overwhelmingly prove that this principle to be on target, win the man, you'll win his household. A growing church needs lots of faithful men. But today exists this attitude that's reflected by Dr. Ira Galloway, once the general secretary of the United Methodist General Board of Discipleship. He wrote, I grew up with the impression that being a Christian was women's business. Men might help pay the bills, but things like praying and teaching Sunday school were left to the women of the church. And it's true, particularly for United Methodists, that we seem to encourage a feminization of the church life. United Methodists Average 65 women to 35 men compared to other mainline churches where the ratio is 57 women to 43 men. And this gives us a challenge. Or listen, let, don't think about statistics. Look at how long a young boy waits until he finally sees a role model of a man teaching Sunday school. For most churches, that boy will be well into his teens if he's fortunate enough to have a man role model teaching and leading his class. Boys need to see men praying, reading the Bible, gentle and kind and caring. Timothy, my son, find faithful men who realize they are critical and crucial to the Christian faith. Men who know what they believe and the men around them. Timothy challenged the men with commitment to radical discipleship, to have a personal faith in Christ and a growing spirituality. Challenge men to become spiritual leaders in their home. Challenge them to reach out other, for other men and bring them to Christ. Now, the second barrier men face, and now increasingly facing women too, is what I call the success syndrome. Dr. James Dobson, who's still on Christian radio, the founder of Focus on the Family, published a tract called Dad, We Really Need You. In it, he tells of his awesome work schedule. 
where he once wrote that he worked 17 nights straight without being home in the evenings for his family. His five-year-old daughter would stand in the door when he left in the morning crying, wondering when she might see him again. Well, his work began to pay off, and his professionally, he was uh, reaping great success. Then his dad wrote him a letter, and here's a portion of it. Your daughter's growing up in the wickedest section of a world much farther gone in the moral decline than the world into which you were born. And I've observed that the greatest delusion is to suppose that our children will be devout Christians simply because their parents have been, or that any of them will enter the Christian faith in any other way than through their parents' deep travail of prayer and faith. But this prayer demands time, time that cannot be given if it's all signed and conscripted and laid on the altar of career ambition. Failure for you at this point would make more success in your occupation a very pale and washed out affair indeed. Well, that letter changed Dr. Dobson's life. To pass the baton of his faith in Jesus to his children would demand time and career sacrifice. Dobson wrote in his book called Straight Talk to Men and Their Wives, if American families are to survive the incredible stresses and dangers they now face, it will be because husbands and fathers provide loving leadership in their homes, placing their wives and children at the highest level of their system of priorities. You see, today, both men and women can place such unbalanced emphasis on career and vocational success that they lose their families, they lose their mates, they lose their children, they lose their church. Today, we're willing to sacrifice our homes, our church, our faith for material success, a better house, a better car, a better way of life. We think we're better parents if we can provide more and more for our kids. Robert Vernon was the police chief in Los Angeles, California. He wrote an article. Let me read just a portion of it. The American home has experienced profound changes in recent years, one of the most significant of which is absentee parents. More often than not, when police officers attempt to notify the parents of juveniles we found or detained, we discover there's no one home. Neither mother nor father's there to welcome children home from school to give them guidance, encouragement that's needed during their formative years. From a materialistic perspective, we have a standard of living that is unequal. Our lives are cluttered with gadgets, convenience, and status symbols, often, however, neglected children, little ones who feel insecure. They're the ones who pay the price for our good life. Whether consciously or not, many parents have come to value material success over and above human values. In a real sense, things have been given present over the most precious possession we have, our children. But spurned love turns into hostility and hatred. And the Bible says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, Ephesians 6, 4. I believe the most profound way we provoke our children is through rejection. Our epidemic of rebellious children is a direct result of neglect, or when material gain replaces guidance and love. To say that we'd better be off to live in tents, cooking over open fires, but having respect for one another, than to live in a two hundred thousand uh, or five hundred thousand dollar homes surrounded by gadgets, despising one another, truly overstates our choice. But we need to value people more than things. Perhaps when we do, the violence will diminish. Moms, dads, our hectic schedules and pace to make more money, to buy more things, can do great harm to our kids. Do we neglect them? Do we neglect our faith? Do we ne neglect our church? Are we too busy to pray or pray with our kids, take a walk, listen? Are we too worn out? to worship on Sunday mornings with our family? Is this just one day to sleep in and catch up on rest that we've missed and prepare for six long days ahead? Or maybe we've been working on Sundays out of dire necessity or because we've grown to uh, count on the extra money, the extra dollars. Men and women, you can be a success in every area of your life, but fail your family. And if you fail your family and fail your church, your success, as Dr. Dobson said, will seem very pale and empty. 
The third barrier that keeps men from being active in church in our, is our contemporary conception, an image of manhood. We are in a truly identity crisis. In the 70s, the village people, you might remember that group if you're old enough, sang a popular song, Macho Man. What, you know, what is a macho man? You know, what is our culture's idea of a man's man? Well, the world says he's the, the, the strongest, the toughest. He can outdrink anybody. He can drive the hardest and fastest. He has a long list of sexual conquests. He can talk the foulest, spend the most money. He views religion as a crutch. Jesus is for weak people and sissies. Real men don't need the church. Nowhere in today's society do you hear that a man, a strong man, is a man who's committed himself to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But it's true. Paul writes to Timothy, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and entrust to faithful men what you've heard from me. Be strong in Christ, Timothy. Be a real man and entrust this gospel to other real men. Men strong in grace, strong in faith, strong in spirit, strong in conviction. Men who faced wild beasts in the fangs of lions in Nero's Colosseum for their faith. Men who, because they would not renounce Christ and his church, suffered in prison, tortured, crucified, impaled on Roman spears. Men, that's what I call. Christian macho, men throughout our church's history who were truly a man's man, a bold man, men who risked their health and their status and their comfort and lives for the cause of Christ, men who were good husbands and good fathers, who knew what they believed, could defend their faith intellectually, and refused to cower in the face of opposition, men who treated both men and women with respect and honor, Men who had a clear purpose for living were bold enough to proclaim their faith in spite of antagonists and opposition. Men who were honest enough to acknowledge their sin and their need for Jesus Christ to be their Savior and Lord. Men who avoided sin and strive for holiness of heart and life. Gary Collins, who wrote the book, The Secrets of Our Sexuality, wrote this, the time has come for men to conform to the biblical image of masculinity. Yes, Timothy, build your church, the church of Jesus Christ, with faithful men, real men of God, who can partner with the faithful women who are committed to Jesus Christ, men who are committed to their wives and families, committed to the life of their church, to winning others, particularly men, to Christ. Rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God. The church for you does wait. Her strength unequal to her task. Rise up and make her great. Rise up, O men of God. Tread where his feet have trod as brothers of the Son of Man. Rise up, O men of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, pray right now that you would bless every man teenager boy listening to this message pray that every woman listening to this message would join in and pray that god would release power and grace to the men in our lives that we might become faithful men men who can be trusted with the riches of the gospel of jesus christ and swim upstream against this culture against this culture that robs true masculinity, that hides what a real man is like. Help us, oh God. We want the church of Jesus Christ to thrive and grow with men and women and teens and children working together to bring forth your kingdom and to win this world for Jesus Christ. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, bless you on this, uh, again, Father's Day. And, uh, you know, every Sunday is our Father's Day. So spend some time in worship with him. Uh, if you're watching this online, uh, go and look at the other uh, 
link and sing uh, one of the songs we'll be singing at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. It's so important that we understand our roles and identities in the church. We are all equal before God. God gives us different roles and places that we play. And boy, there's a really important role for faithful men to lead their families, to lead their church, to partner with their wives, change the world. Do that. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Go and be the hands and feet of Christ in your world. God bless you. See you next week.